Hello again, everyone, and welcome to this week's Money and Market Squawk Call, where we go around the horn with our editors to give you their insights on the happenings in global markets and the economy for this week and beyond. Today is Tuesday, August 5th. I'm Mike Burnick, and joining us today are Doug Davenport, Larry Edelson, Mike Larson, Mandeep Rye, and Bill Hall. Well, the uh, month of July certainly ended last week on a bit of a bearish note with the, uh, the market down pretty much across the board. The Dow lost about, uh, I believe it was 2.6 percent. S&P 500 and NASDAQ were both down about 2 percent last week. In fact, uh, for the entire month of July, we saw the first decline for U.S. stocks since, well, since the year began in January. So I guess the key question I'd like to hear from, from each one of you and whatever else is on your mind is, do you think this is the start of a more of a major correction, a 10% plus, which is certainly overdue, or is it going to be just a short, sharp correction right back to new highs? Doug, why don't we start with you? Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, great question about uh, what the market is doing. And the S&P did drop 2.6% last week, and that is the largest weekly loss that we've had in 113 weeks, and that's just a little more than two years. But I found that there's really no correlation between a, a large sudden weekly drop in any formation of market tops out there. Now, usually a market top, you get a lot of volatility clusters up there, and you'll get several large weekly drops separated by, you know, a couple of weeks where the market bounces back. So the fact that there was that 2.6% drop last week uh, after really two years means, I think, in my opinion, very little as far as any possible trend reversal. And I don't think it should be used as an indicator of a market top. Now, a market top may be forming. We don't know, or maybe not. But a 2.6% drop after 113 weeks is not a sign for it yet. Now, uh, if you look, um, let me get some of my notes that I have. Uh, on a shorter-term basis, a long-term, the trend is still up. On a shorter-term basis, what we're seeing here is just a technically driven oversold bounce from last Friday's low that we saw around 1914, and we retested and tested that yesterday and defended it, and we had a nice day up uh, for Monday. But the market has been in a rectangular box, and I like to use these boxes because you can see it graphically. Since the 1st of July, we've been between 1952 on the top and 1991, uh, 1952 on the bottom, I'm sorry, and 1991 on the top. So if last week could be, just as I said, another minor uh, routine pullback uh, that we could see develop into a bear trap as of last Friday, and then the market pushes back up to 1952 to 1991 level. Uh, but if I think if this market uh, doesn't hold that 1914 level in the S&P, we could easily uh, kind of go down to some next support, which is around 1890. Now, I still favor that the low of last week's pullback has not been set yet, and we could see a, a, a pullback and then a bounce back, which is, which is what I'm hoping that we'll see. So I'd rather bounce back from a lower level than the level that we did yesterday. And getting back to longer term, the S&P, uh, as I wrote in my commentary this week, has not broken its 20-bar moving uh, weekly average since 2012, and it only violated the 20-week moving average twice. Uh, in 2012, and that was in November and in May of that year. So we'd have to break about 1880 on the S&P right now to, to change that to, uh, uh, or to change that intermediate trend to being down. And also, I had in my commentary that, uh, that I found a, a study that showed that market tops never have ever ever occurred uh, in the S&P when you had a P.E. below 21. We're around 17 and a half now. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that we can't have a market top because the market, as we all know, can darn well do what it wants to do. But we've never had a market top if it's been below 21. So uh, at a level of 17 right now, uh, maybe we're just not at that market top level uh, yet. Um, still long oil, gold, emerging markets, uh, my equity sectors of energy services and materials had a very good day yesterday after having a kind of a pet week last week, and they bounced back yesterday. And that's what you want to see bounce back for the market uh, energy, and you want to see the basic material stocks do well, and they did yesterday. Uh, long China, still think the Asian markets are attractive compared to the U.S. Emerging markets are attractive. Um, with gold, uh, I just hope it gets to doing something here soon and, and, and moves. It needs to 
uh, needs to stop declining here and uh, to get going. And uh, we have to think with all the problems in Israel and worldwide that gold ought to be doing better, but gold has a mind of its own. So I'm, I'm hoping it will get going here. I don't want to see it uh, pull through that 1280 level uh, for 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 gold prices. So that's my uh, look uh, and thoughts for this week. All right, Doug, thanks. Larry, let's uh, let's go to you. I know you've been looking for a uh, correction in stocks for some time. Do you think we uh, we finally have it right here? Yeah, I think so. I, I think it's it's the first uh, tremors, if you will. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we bounce back up to about 1950, 52 on the S&P. And to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if we got the new highs. But in my opinion, it's unquestionable that the top is forming. Uh, all my models indicate that we were very close or have already seen the highs. And um, we're looking at a five to ten month bear market, according to my models, cyclical models, uh, that could stretch into December or into uh, May of next year with about 20% downside from the final high, from either the highs that we saw last week before the sell-off or any new nominal new high. Um, it's what's needed for the long-term bull market to renew itself and get some energy. And uh, just like uh, any any market that, that uh, gold in particular, which had a three-year bear market, I certainly don't expect that in stock, you got to wash out the bulls. you got to wash out the bulls occasionally in order to renew the energy for the upside. So um, that said, you know, long-term is very, very bullish for the stock market. Um, but I do expect uh, about a 20% pullback. And uh, whether it started last week or it starts with one more nominal new high remains to be seen. I tend to think uh, that we've already seen the highs. So, and I agree short term with Doug that we'll probably uh, take out last uh, Thursday or Friday's lows and get down to about 1890, maybe 1880, where I have on my systems uh, a major weekly bearish reversal at 1879 on the cash S&P. Um, gold, yeah, it's acting terribly, <laughs> um, but it's still well within support and confines for rally up to first 1330, then 1360, then 1395, and uh, we just might have to wait a little bit longer for it to unfold because the summer season is weak period for precious metals. Um, oil, I also agree with Doug, uh, looking very strong, intermediate, and long term. And uh, the dollar is acting very, very strong. Again, that's, you know, because of the euro and what's happening in Europe and also for having money that wants to get out of Russia um, is leaving in droves, even though uh, Putin's popularity is about 83% in the polls. There's a lot of smart people in Russia with big money that just don't want to have their money tied up in Russia. Um, there are a lot of stories, there have been a lot of stories that I've seen in the Financial Times recently, the Wall Street Journal, Russians are buying uh, property, uh, high-end property in Manhattan and up in uh, L.A. And I can tell you here in Thailand, they seem to love Thailand. Russian money is pouring into Thailand. Uh, and um, In fact, entire towns have been taken over by Russians, like Pattaya on the Gulf of Siam is basically a Russian Thai town now with all the street signs in Russian and Thai, and, uh, and uh, they even have their own Russian TV station in Padilla. Um, so this is capital flight, which is all good for the market's long return from commodities to equities uh, in the U.S., um, not so much in, in Europe. I also agree with Doug on Asia. Asia is ripe for a huge rally, and whoever says, you know, um, they haven't um, disconnected is going to be surprised because uh, Europe and the U.S. is going to go down and Asia is going to go up. And that's really it. That's an interesting point. So you think that uh, Asia and emerging markets, you're specifically, I, I would imagine, talking about China and some of the peripheral countries, Thailand, Indonesia, you think they can rally even if the U.S. and Europe are in a, uh, a, a five-, six-month bear market? Yes, I do because um, – First, technically and cyclically, they've already had their bear markets. China's been in a bear market for three-plus years. Um, 
so that's that's done. It, it, it's ahead of the, ahead of the game there. It, it's already bottomed and it's turning back up. And as I said all, all along, there's no implosion going on in China. I don't care what anybody says, unless you're on the ground there or here in Asia and you see what's going on. There, there's, their economy's fine. Um, they're also the recipient of a lot of capital inflows for the same reasons the United States is. There's a lot of money seeking the yuan now uh, versus the euro and versus the ruble. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of increased volume and liquidity going into a new major currency that's really being born now, which is the yuan. I'm not saying it's going to be the world's reserve currency. It's not. But um, it's becoming, uh, each and every day, a, a, a much more liquid, uh, deeper currency to be uh, parking money in than um, many other currencies. Um, it's really, you know, right up there. In fact, the, the, I read an article a couple of weeks ago. I'll have to dig it out and circulate it. But um, the uh, renminbi is now the second largest currency in the world in terms of um, volume and liquidity. It's beaten out the euro. And not in all respects, but in some respects. Interesting. Uh, so, you you know, kind of a sign of things yeah. to come. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks for those thoughts. So, um, very interesting. I'm very optimistic. Yeah. I mean, just look at Thailand, up 22% for the year. Seven months, basically, despite a military coup. <laughs> Indeed, the Asian emerging markets have certainly been leading the pack here for a little while. All right. Well, thanks for those comments. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Mike Larson. Mike, we had that uh, Fed meeting and uh, a little bit of the angst, perhaps, that we saw in the stock market last week. Might it be something to do with the, the fact that folks are worried the uh, Fed may have to raise rates sooner rather than later? A couple of Fed governors indicating that. What, what, do you, what is your take? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, if you want to know why the stock market really got hammered, you know, don't, I mean, don't look any further than the junk bond market. If you put up a chart of JNK or HYG, kind of the two main ETFs that track the junk bond market, you'll see they got destroyed in the last two weeks or so. HYG and JNK both had the worst declines going all the way back to the taper tantrum last, uh, last spring. So bottom line is, you know, what's driving that? Well, there's been obviously irrational exuberance in junk bonds fueled by Fed easy money. Um, and e even the mere talk of, of, potential Fed pulling out of money printing, you know, we saw how that ignited the first round of a taper tantrum, and this was kind of a junior taper tantrum uh, in select portions of the bond market and obviously the stock market this time around. It's crazy to see that when we have six straight months of 200,000-plus job growth, which is basically the best since 1997, um, we see several other economic indicators that are all at levels not seen since, pick your number, 2005, 2011, 2007. Um, all the indicators suggest the economy is in much better shape now, uh, and I'm sick and tired of hearing a lot of whining about that. The indicators all point in the same direction, um, yet that's bad for stocks because it means the Fed may have to stop its its policy that's calibrated for a crisis that hasn't been with us for five-plus years. So I would say that my general view of the Fed and in, in, in my corner of the markets is that People are, the Fed is, is way off sides on its economic pessimism now, just like it was way off sides on its economic optimism back in the mid-2000s, uh, and they're going to have to get on sides over time. So that process is going to lead to some dislocations, uh, you know, in some of these areas where valuations have been stretched. Rather than just trying to go long the entire stock market or short the entire stock market, what I've been trying to do is focusing on kind of the winners and centers companies that might benefit in these markets and those in sort of their own private bull markets, even as the broader market's doing its thing. And I think that makes sense simply because the correlations in the market aren't like they were in the mid-2000s to, uh, to, you know, to the crisis when everything went up or everything went down. There's really a lot more differentiation there. Um, you know, just to pick on, on a couple sectors, I mean, energy's done very well up until this correction over the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, healthcare, some of the, uh, the hospital stocks that I've been recommending have done extremely well. Um, you know, MLPs have done very well. Uh, you know, meanwhile, you've seen some companies like uh, food stocks, after having a very strong early start to the year, have gotten hammered. So you've got a lot more diversification or a lot more uh, difference in performance. So, you know, I'm trying not to focus on is the S&P up or is the S&P down, and I'm just trying to find some individual companies that are going to be winners um, from some of these private bull market sectors. Uh, 
you know, I mentioned healthcare. Steel was another one that the steel stocks have all broken out. Uh, Chinese stocks, after performing terribly for a long time, you know, China is now coming back as the economic data gets better there. So, you know, I think as an investor, you've got to you've got to get a little more granular here and focus on what's working and what's not working, and you know, buy one and sell the other. Okay, interesting. Uh, Mandy, how about your take on markets right now? Hey, Mike. Hey, hello, everybody. So uh, those that have been complaining about the complacency and the lack of a pullback in the markets obviously saw that thrown out the window last week. The VIX rose, markets dropped, you know, yields dropped. And and to your question, Mike, I, I think it was a good thing. I think the, the complacency drew on itself. It attracted uh, market participants that were lured by that never-ending, continual bull rally. And, and that kind of investor does not have the... Uh, uh, you know, the stomach for the, these kinds of losses, and they, they sell panickingly. Um, you know, the average return in the S&P the, since 1950 is around 7.5% with a standard deviation of 20%. So in any given year in U.S. equity, you could stand to lose 20% of your money. But, you know, so that, that said, if you take a step back and you look at the corporate earnings picture, we saw 4.3% sales growth. That's up from, like, you know, 2% growth the previous quarter, 9.5% uh, earnings growth. That's that's pretty strong. And then the economic numbers, which included a GDP print of 4%. Uh, we'll be watching the, the factory orders numbers today at 10 o'clock in the, uh, the service sector ISM for the continuation of that story. But, uh, you know, things have been favorable. They, uh, in terms of the overall economy at a macro, micro level, there's been geopolitical, there's been noise, uh, you know, some, some uh, the crisis in, in uh, the the debt uh, holders uh, in Argentina have uh, had to, you know, face what's a, you know, the default situation there. But largely in the U.S., we're looking at earnings, which are more correlated to longer-term stock market price increases, and they have been favorable. Um, and, uh, you know, with that, we'll also give you uh, the flip side. The, we looked at the unemployment numbers a little bit closer, and the job creation has been in lower-wage jobs. Jobs in the retail sector and the travel leisure sectors, they're adding jobs. Finance, utilities, mining, uh, those are the higher paying jobs and they've slowed. They've been basically flat and they haven't had as, added as much growth in, in jobs over the last 12 months. Uh, and if you look at that in context with the consumer, uh, who has basically been working longer hours, average, average weekly hours are up, um, and wage growth year over year has, has been about 2%. Uh, and then you have inflation basically at 2%. That's that's not good. Uh, you want to see more real not, real growth, not just nominal growth, in, in, in wages for consumers. So they need to go out there and spend more money, uh, have businesses be more confident about future pro growth prospects, invest more in their businesses, um, and uh, and continually to, to, to feed itself in that, in that cycle. So there's some good and some bad, but uh, I think – we think is more uh, good than bad. I think this uh, this pullback is something that we had been waiting for, uh, getting some of that hot money out of the markets, and, and we think it took we took it as an opportunity to carefully uh, enter uh, into uh, one of our more compelling investments that you know it proved itself over and over again. It's, it's, we know the fundamentals of this company. Uh, we know when the stock price is on sale. So you know that being said, it doesn't mean that uh, it can't go down. You know there's going to be more complacency. There's going to be more. Sorry, there's going to be more risk take, uh, taken off here. Uh, but we think the the risk reward fundamentals for such plays, like Mike was saying, on a stock specific basis, if you know the stock. Uh, there could be opportunities to, to get in uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, better prices here. So, you know, the, with the emotional selling, we think we, we got a uh, nice overdue gut check. It could be more of that, but, uh, you know, taking it took some of the hotter money out and it's giving us opportunity here uh, for more longer-term oriented investors. All right. Good buying opportunity. I appreciate your views. You got it. Uh, Bill Hall, let's go to you. You've been talking recently about the possibility of seeing some sort of a, uh, a credit crunch or credit crisis, and sure enough, over the weekend, we saw that Portugal was forced to, to bail out one of their biggest banks. Do you think this is the uh, tip of the iceberg and there's more to come? What are your views? Uh, I, I, well, that's a good point that you just made, Mike. I believe that, yes, we live in an over world, so you start with that supposition. There's still way too much debt in the world. Do I think that we have an eminent credit crisis? No, because I think that we, they were, we were able to work through the Argentinian problem and the problem in Portugal. So that, 
leads me to believe that, you know, we're, we're not on the edge of any crisis, but we still have not resolved the issue as it relates to just living in an over-leveled, an over-levered world, a world where there's just too much debt. Um, I sort of look at the, 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 the problems that we have in the junk bond market a little differently than Mike, uh, Larson does. I look at that, that, uh, the, those ETFs declined, declined because the world was worried about default risk as, a, as opposed to interest rate risk. I still think interest rates are going to be low. We're back below two and a half percent on the, uh, U.S. Treasury 10 year. I mean, the, the Portuguese 10 years just at 3.67 percent. I mean, German bonds, their long bonds, you know, are below 2 percent. So, you know, I believe we live in an over-level world. Uh, I believe that what Mandy talked about, the U.S. consumer under big pressure because of wage issues. Yes, we're adding jobs, but those jobs are not uh, high-paying jobs. So until we can get the economy moving again, and I don't, see, I don't see any signs. Now, that's what makes a market because other people do see signs. I think we're still slow growth, uh, low, low interest rate, low inflation world. Okay, so you uh, would basically stick to your investment strategy as it is now and then in that kind of an environment, or are you looking to be more defensive? I'm not looking to be more defensive. I just think I'm looking for where there's more growth, and right now there's plenty of growth. And Well, there's more growth, not plenty. I mean, uh, restate that, but there's a lot more growth in the emerging markets than there are in there is in the developed world, meaning the U.S. and Europe. So, and those valuations have become compelling, even though the, the emerging markets have rallied a little bit. And it looks like uh, there's some liquidity flowing back into those markets. The issue is, when you're an emerging markets investor, you can be right as rain as it relates to your economic forecast and your company forecast. But if you get uh, investment flows going against you, you're just going to get crushed. And what had happened there for a while was people just didn't, or institutionals just didn't have the, the appetite for the market risk in the emerging markets, and people are trying, starting to gravitate back towards those markets because valuations have become compelling. So I'm looking at the developing world, the emerging markets, and I think the way you can play that is through either pure play ETFs on emerging markets, or you can buy very large cap U.S. and European companies that have a, 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 a large portion of their sales in the emerging markets. Indeed, it certainly seems like the money flows are back in favor of emerging markets. Thanks, Bill. Well, let's see. I don't want to leave anybody off. I, I believe that might be every, everybody on the call today, but uh, feel free to speak up if I missed anyone. If not, then I guess we'll call it a day. Uh, that will wrap things up for today's Squawk Call. Great insights, gentlemen, one and all. Thank you very much, and be sure to tune in again next week. Until then, I'm Mike Burnick for Money and Markets, Market Investing. Good.